Okay, we're now in uh, live session. I'd just like to welcome all members uh, to the room, and I want to welcome Colin, um, uh, who is sitting at home, uh, and I wish him the best. Um, I'm sure I will not do justice to the chair's chair today, but um, you're like a guardian angel overlooking me at the minute, so you can, you can keep me you can keep me right. Uh, you are the only person on Starleaf, uh, and at this moment in time, uh, I have only got one apology, and that apology uh, is from Christopher Stalford, and we wish to, we wish. Hello. We wish Christopher yeah, Stalford well. Thank you, Hello. Yep. You can hear me now. I don't know what is going on there. Maybe. Well, uh, uh, Emma, welcome. So I'll, I'll now say we've also got Emma on the. Uh, uh, and, and just if you're looking confused and you say you don't look like Colin, I, I'm not. Colin's on Star Meet with you, and, and I'm I'm chairing today. Uh, Advised members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout the building and online. Uh, and of course, with your mobile devices, such as my, my do myself, just move them away uh, from the IT equipment so we don't get any uh, feedback. Move on to the draft minutes of four uh, members that the draft minutes of the meeting held on 23rd of September 2020 are at page five of the meeting pack. Uh, if the members are content, uh, th these are true in reflection of the procedures of the meetings. Uh, please so indicate you're content. Yep. And, yeah. Thank you. There you go. Uh, matters arising. There is no matters uh, arising. Uh, uh, October 2020 uh, monitoring round oral evidence session with departments officials uh, is where we will start and refer members to page 10 of the meeting pack and page 4 uh, of the table pack uh, for relevant papers. Uh, the officials are in attendance today to brief members on the latest position in relation to the October 2020 monitoring round. The return has to be made to the Department for Finance this Friday. Uh, so if members have any concerns about the return, they need to raise them with officials during this session. So this is our one shot because it has to be in by Friday. Trevor, welcome. Uh, and if I could just uh, welcome to Mark Brown, the Auditing Office Officer from the Executive Office, and Neil Lloyd, the Director of Finance and Corporate Services of the Executive Office, uh, and Tara Kennedy, the Head of Finance Branch, uh, the Executive Office. Uh, if I could advise you all that the session is being recorded by Hansard, and the transcript will be published uh, on the committee's uh, website. Thank you very much for coming along. I, I think I might have to do this throughout the day, but uh, I'm not Colin McGrath. Uh, <laughs> Colin is up there, but, but um, I'm covering the, 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 the chair today. So uh, if I could invite the, the members to give us uh, their brief. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, first of all, thanks to the committee for the opportunity to provide a briefing on TEO's approach to the October monitoring uh, round. We did, we did provide a briefing paper and I'll just uh, give some opening remarks to basically summarise what's in the, uh, the briefing paper. Uh, in terms of the June monitoring round, you'll be aware that TEO received additional uh, Ardell budget of £2.5 million to advance necessary preparatory work for the Victims Payment Scheme in 2021 and uh, £0.5 million towards the Department's COVID-19 pressures. The October monitoring round has provided a further opportunity to review our spending plans and assess our budgetary requirements for 2020-21. We have a residual uh, COVID-19 pressure of £3.4 million. Pounds. And since June monitoring, we ha have had two further opportunities to submit COVID-19 bids to the Department of Finance. We have not to date received any further funding for the Department's COVID-19 pressures. And we're currently forecasting uh, a resource Dell non ring fenced overspend of 1.7 million. Reduced requirements of some uh, 0 0.7 million have been identified across the department's non ring fenced budgets, with a further 0 0.5 million identified by our arm's length bodies. Uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, budgetary pressures of 0 0.2 million uh, have also been uh, identified. So the net effect of these easements and pressures. Uh, has been to partly offset the COVID-19 pressure, and we therefore intend to submit a bid of 1.5 million for COVID-19 cost pressures in the October monitoring round. So that's what we, we reckon our pressure actually is. In terms of the department's ring fence budgets, you'll be aware that TEO received ring fence funding of 37.5 million for the historical institutional abuse inquiry for 2020-21. <coughs> 
Uh, and due to the time required to get redress panels f fully operational, an easement of £10 million has been identified uh, in this monitoring round. We intend to ask DOF if they will consider reassigning £1.5 million from that ring-fenced easement to meet the Department's non-ring-fenced COVID-19 pressure. Turning to uh, financial transactions capital, uh, we also intend to submit a bid of £30 million in relation to the third tranche of FTC funding for the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Should the timing of the project mean that we do not require this third tranche in the current financial year, once we've drawn it down, the Department of Finance have provided TEO with very welcome assurance that they will be able to facilitate taking back the budget cover to the centre. And that's important, otherwise we would have a huge underspend on our books. In terms of our capital budget, our conventional capital, if you like, um, we have identified a non-ring-fenced reduced requirement of 0.5 million in the October monitoring round. This is essentially due to the postponement um, of a contribution relating to uh, traffic management in Abington um, of some 0.3 million uh, and the sale of an asset within uh, Maze Long Cash. We also intend to declare an easement of 0.6 million for ring-fenced capital in relation to social investment fund projects, primarily as a result of the impact which COVID-19 has had uh, on progress. NIO uh, asked the Equality Commission and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission to undertake the scrutiny and monitoring role that will form the dedicated mechanism to ensure that there is no diminution of rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity, as set out in the Good Friday Agreement, uh, for people here following the UK's exit from the EU. ECMI has new oversight powers and as such uh, needs adequate funding to discharge this new function. And HMT has agreed to provide ECNI with additional funding over the three financial years 2021, 21, 22, and 22, 23. That funding will be ring fenced, and the 2021 amount will be made available as part of the October monitoring round. We also have a number of routine technical transfers of budgets to and from other departments, which we will process uh, during this monitoring round. We will be keeping the budgetary position of the Department <coughs> under close scrutiny over the coming uh, weeks and months, as we always do. Um, so I trust that that has been helpful in giving an overview, Chair. I um, would be very happy uh, to take questions from the members <coughs> on the approach to October monitoring. Mark, thank, thank you. Um, like, like everything, when we talk about um, budgets, it is full of, of, of data and it is full of amounts of money. and, and uh, it can um, sometimes be lost in the margins a little bit, but can I just ask maybe just a couple of questions just for, for, for a little bit of understanding. Following the June monitoring round, this is the residual pressure for COVID-19 stood at 2.2 million, but that, that's now been increased to 3.4 million, uh, and you reckon that that increase is down to data analytics? C can you expand on that increase on data analytics? Well, part of the, the, the um, central hub uh, that is set up to, to, to provide information to ministers um, uh, is, is part, of, part of that pro pro process is gathering information from the various departments and making sure that it's presented in easily digestible form that um, sets out clearly what the key issues are up to ministers. Uh, and that provision uh, and that support and that analysis has been provided uh, through uh, consultancy support uh, to that Northern Ireland hub. <laughs> and it has proved uh, very, very useful and beneficial to ministers. I mean, if you see some of the, I'm sure some of you have seen some of the SITREP um, reports that have come to the executive, which, which set it very clearly what the key issues are. And that is designed to support the continuation of that data, uh, sorry, data analytics function. Um, should, it, should it be required? If, if there is a second spike, and the way things are going, it looks as if uh, you know the, the, there is going to be a requirement for that. So that's really what that's about. It's, it's about gathering and presenting information in an easy, digestible form, and making sure key points are apparent to ministers so they can it can inform their decision making. And I, I and I can get that, and I can understand that because data is really key to fighting this. So, so you're, you're you're absolutely right. But what we're talking about is an increase of 1.2 million pounds for that service. Um, that's what we're talking about. Uh, you know, if, if we look at the if we look at the difference, um, did we put that out to, to various different firms to, to come back to us with that? Are we getting the best uh, bang for the buck here at 1.2 million pounds for, for data? And bearing in mind that this is a second surge, if we have a third and a fourth and a fifth surge, are we 
Are we talking about putting in millions into these companies? Well, I think the first point to make is it's not so much that it's an additional cost. The, the initial uh, uh, cost was only for a period of time, so it was for a certain number of months. That, that, is, that has expired. This is in order to continue the contract that the funding is being is, is, is being <coughs> and that's what what the cost of the data analytics uh, is. So, uh, I mean, this is something that has been found to be very very beneficial um, and uh, um, something that ministers have valued. But you can understand why. I mean, it's an eye-watering amount of money. You know, so I don't want to labour it too much, but you know, it, it does it does jump out at me. And, and I don't know, but maybe if, if, if other members would have a, a view on that when they come to asking questions, but. If I could ask another one, please, um, and again, this is just about expanding for knowledge. Uh, the £30 million bid for financial transactions capital is due to the anticipated pipeline of investments to be made by the Northern Ireland Investment Fund at the end of March 21. What, what are those investments? I don't have the details of what those particular investments are, but the, the Northern Ireland Investment Fund is a mechanism that has been set up to identify opportunities for for uh, investment that can help to stimulate uh, the the economy, and it 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 it, it uh, can involve significant investments in property, uh, be, be it office or, or or whatever. So this is, I mean, I, I I can come back to you with the precise detail of how that's set up, yeah. but it's really a mechanism that's been that was made 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 available for that investment to try and stimulate the the economy. So. Um, we submit a bid because it's 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 within our boundary. We we submit a bid uh, for that. Now um, the FTC, by definition, has to have a private sector element to it. So that's why it lends itself to that that particular fund. And the fact is that the executive has, has a difficulty finding appropriate avenues to u make use of FTC. So this has been an important avenue to use. The important protection for us is that if the uh, investment fund doesn't actually manage to make those investments, although we draw down the funds, we're, we have the facility to give that back to the Department of Finance and not have it sitting on our books. Otherwise, it, it would be a very significant uh, underspend. We don't really have any significant role in this other than holding the money. And, 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 that's, a, and that's a fair one, Mark. And I guess all I'm trying to do is maybe just drill down, and maybe even for our own knowledge. But it would be re really useful, I think it would be really useful, even to get the top five top investments just so we have a, a, a better understanding of what we're talking about here and, and that money distribution between uh, those, in, those investments, um, uh, if, that's, if, that's, if that's OK. Uh, happy to respond. I'm sure you'll write after the committee meeting with that request. Yeah, uh, the, if I could ask, I mean, the sooner we can get it, the better would be really, really, really useful. Um, Mark, thank you. That's all, that's all I have. Um, uh, so before I open it to, to the other members, I'm just going to call in Colin uh, for any questions. Colin? Okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Chair. I appreciate that. And thank you for carrying out the duties today. That's appreciated for this week and next week as I get through my 14 days of self-isolating thanks to the COVID app. Um, so um, maybe if I could ask, I noticed in there, Mark, there was about 8.3 million that has been returned from the EU, the Peace 4 projects. Um, have you got any sense of what that is? That that seems like a large amount of money that's that that's there to be delivered out on the projects on the ground, but doesn't seem to be making its way down there. Now, there's obvious reasons through COVID for that, but is there been no way that that money has been able to be connected to the, the groups at all? And what happens to that money when it comes back in? Is that money that goes back to Europe, or is that match funding that stays within uh, TEO? Well, I think the first assurance I can give the committee is that, is that that money is not lost. Um, the funding, uh, the EU funding is there for the entire programme. What this is, is a, a profiling issue in terms of what can be spent in year. And where that funding can't be spent in year, then there's the opportunity, as there is with, with other public expenditure, to give that money back. And it will be spent in following years. It only becomes an issue when we get towards the end of the programme. Uh, if all the funding hasn't been allocated at that point. So at this point, that's not funding that has been lost. Uh, 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 it, is, it is something that SEUPB have advised us of. And one of the issues we have is that SEUPB manage these projects uh, on our behalf, even though they're on our books. So we are reliant on them in terms of their profiling of spend and uh, whether or not there's any underspend. Uh, so uh, we get the return from them, and then we uh, have to manage that. Um, um, but I think the important thing is the money isn't lost. Some of the projects have been impacted by what many other projects have been impacted by in terms of COVID-19, and that has affected some of the, the, the means of delivery and the pace of delivery. But it doesn't affect the, the overall amount of money that's available from the EU. 
Well, that's certainly good news that that money still is there. It can be recycled back to them again at a later point whenever they're ready to spend it, which is good news. Um, I noticed in the FTC funding there as well about 80 million that has been set aside for the University of Ulster project. Now, notwithstanding that there are a lot of you know discussions about the length of time of that project and its delivery, is there somewhere else that's a, a, another committee or another place that's managing the observation of that money and its spend? Because I think this is one of the first times I've kind of noticed the Ulster University project coming up as a spent line within TEO. So is it just a case that it's because it's coming out of FTC, you have to account for it, but it's actually another department that will be managing it and, and sort of shadowing it to make sure that it's delivered? Well, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Colin. The, the, the arrangements uh, are around the stem from the fact that some departments uh, do not have lending capability and they can't make loans. Uh, and therefore, they're not in a position to be able to take on the FTC and to lend it out. So in this case, it's the Department for the Economy. Uh, now, part of the actions when we looked at this, when financial transactions capital first became available, was to say, well, we want to use the money, so how can we get it out there, accepting that some departments don't have lending facilities, um, and accepting the fact, too, that with the, the finance, or the, the private finance element to this, it, there are... It can only go into certain types of enterprises, like universities, which are, to my knowledge, charities. Um, so uh, it was important to be able to get the funding out there. And we have lending powers through the, the, the Strategic Investment Board. And therefore, we act as a route for the money to come from the Department of Finance. It goes through our books, through the, 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 the Strategic Investment Board, and then it goes on out to the u u university. Um, but you're quite right in that there has to be clear understanding of the arrangement for managing that money, because there is always a risk of repayments not being made, uh, and, and there's, there's a risk then back through the accounts, both of SIB and ourselves as a department. So we have uh, a service level agreement with the Department for the Economy, um, who, who uh, would have done the business case and would be overseeing the arrangement for a repayment, who would be make, doing due diligence about the capacity of Ulster University to meet these repayments and putting in place the oversight arrangements. And the Permanent Secretary there writes to me every year as an accounting officer to give me assurance that those arrangements are in place and are working effectively. Uh, and that's the assurance that I take from the assurance he gives me. Okay, and just finally, just to welcome the fact that we've got a report this time before it's been submitted, and, and to thank the department for that. But just if we could continue to get it on time, it would always be appreciated. But thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin. Um, uh, if I call Trevor Clark, that'll be Trevor London and Pat Sheehan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mark's presentation. I suppose it's maybe more where the, the Chair was today in, in terms of analytics. I'm not sure that really he did answer how that, that cost can continue. I mean, I, I suppose whenever you expand it, the question was saying that there could be other, hopefully not, that there could be other um, peaks in terms of so we're talking about the second peak now, third, fourth and fifth. But I mean, the money, I'm, I'm just not clear that the answer was given. I, I can understand the rationale for needing something, but the cost and maybe in terms of how that, that service is procured, where you look for that, because I mean, I think even in terms of the accuracy, that hasn't been entirely good either. Well, um, first of all, the, the, the appropriate procurement uh, arrangements were followed in this case, so, so this would, would, would have been on foot of a, a business case, uh, and in the particular instance where it's, it goes to one particular company, there would have been a direct award contract made, which would have been approved by the, the Central Procurement Directorate and myself as accounting officer, so the appropriate process has, has been followed uh, around this. This is not an area where there is there, uh, uh, a very extensive market. Um, and it's one that's quite specialised. Um, so that's why the costs um, are, are fairly um, significant. But I think the few uh, of uh, those that have been working in the Northern Ireland Hub, and indeed the, um, the view expressed by ministers, was that this information is important and valuable, uh, and that this is an important resource to keep, um, to keep in place. Mm. I suppose maybe to expand that then, if, if as was said, that this is the second way of... Is there any indication, or can you furnish the, the committee with, I see, how those costs arrived that were first second and an additional, and what period that, that actually covers? Well, again, we can we can we can bring those costs to you, Chair, if you're right. Just to get the detail. I don't have the detail of all of that uh, uh, in front of me, um, but uh, there will be ongoing costs. Now, part of what we seek to do in all of this is to ensure that there's appropriate skills transfer where there is expertise like that. 
Uh, and I know that that is something that within the department, in that, in that part of the department, which is looking after the emergency response, they are looking at how they can uh, develop the expertise within the NICS to transfer from the consultant so that going forward we don't need to have this uh, 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 contract uh, in place. But I think the important thing um, is, and the most significant thing here, yes, we, we, we obviously have to look at costs. But the most important thing here is that the executive has to be armed with the information it needs to manage this pandemic at the moment. That's the single most important thing, and we identified this as a significant risk that there wouldn't be the information that ministers needed coming in a timely way and in, in a, a way that ministers would would, would be able to, to digest quickly and understand the full impact of. It was considered to be a significant risk, and that was why we moved quickly through a direct award contract to try and put this in place. I suppose for me, I see opens up a different question, but I mean, given this place is here, the length of time as it is, that why we haven't got something like that in house, um, because yes, this may be sprung upon us, but there is other, there's other things this could have been used for previously. So, so I'm curious why that expertise hasn't been developed within the department or indeed the executive. That we didn't have to actually procure this. Well, uh, I think part of the process in, in, in going for a direct award contract, indeed, and, and in, in um, deciding to bring this expertise in from outside was to look internally, first of all, to see was that support and expertise available within the NICS. No, I think maybe, I, my, maybe I didn't make it clear. In, in terms of the length of time that the Assembly is back, um, why was it not considered important to actually have something like that available in-house previously? And could be used for other purposes, as opposed to whenever a crisis like this comes along, and I say having to procure that. And now, in terms of your own answer, you've said that looking at this maybe for the future. Well, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand the, the thrust of your question now. So, uh, uh, prior to that, there, there, there would have been a civil contingencies branch uh, within the um, department, which acts as a coordinating function whenever there's an emergency of any sort, that uh, like flooding, for example, or, or, or a storm surge, or those sorts of things, and that acted as a coordinating mechanism to bring together the various responders and make sure that um, the appropriate action was being taken and there was communication to ministers. Now, what we have found uh, is that as COVID came in, that that function uh, wasn't, um, didn't have the, 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 the breadth of knowledge and expertise. Uh, and indeed, the, the sufficient personnel to be able to deal with uh, an issue of this magnitude, which was which was unprecedented, it is unprecedented. So there's been learning from that in terms of what is needed to deal with the uh, COVID, and that first wave has has identified those lessons. So we're trying to make sure that we are maintaining the expertise for the second wave. There's also a review of the civil contingencies function ongoing within the department to try and look at going forward, uh, both in terms of the potential for, for this pandemic, but if other such events arise, how do we need to reconfigure that civil contingencies function, give it the right expertise, give it the right support, resource it in an appropriate way to enable the, the executive to respond. So I would have to say this has been a learning point. I think COVID's been a learning point for everyone, frankly. It, 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 it was such a, a shock to the system that um, there was a need to bring in particular expertise, but we want to build that in going forward to the, the ongoing arrangements. I suppose finally not trying to dwell on the point, Chair. Um, so yourself, is this a Northern Ireland-based company that's doing this service, or is this something we're bringing from the mainland? It's a Northern Ireland-based company. Or it, it may be one that operates in the UK, but it's, 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 well, it's, 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 it's Northern Ireland. It's, it's a Northern Ireland arm of, of a broader okay. company. So, so, I mean, that says to me that there is expertise within Northern Ireland that yeah. probably should have been within central government before, I suppose, before something like this, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to procure it on an ongoing cost and in probably a very expensive way of doing it, the way we're doing it currently. So, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Trevor? Yeah, it's just a small point, Mark. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the sale of an asset at the maze on cash. What, what sort of asset are we talking about? Um, I think that one was... Uh, Building. It was the um, sale of a lease. The sale of a lease. Yes. Yeah. Tara. Come again, sorry. It was the sale of a lease. So one of one of the operations already. Uh... No, it's to do with land. Right. But it's to, <coughs> it's, to, it's, to, it's to do with the RUAS and the ah, yeah, okay. and the leases that they have. So um, uh, a lease on a further section was triggered, uh, which triggered a payment from the RUAS. Because they, they they have various um, arrangements with 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 Maze Corporation to uh, lease out various parts of the land and 
because they've been developing it yeah, no, for enough. the least it's um, triggered. So that, that actually isn't, you know, it's not an underspend. It's actually a good, it's a good thing, Probably. but it appears as an underspend. It's one of those uh, uh, strange things. Well, it's, it's, it's a return on an asset. <laughs> Uh, it wouldn't be any kind of common practice to try and sell off bits of the mess site, would it? If that's ever happened. Well, if there was any disposal, there are, are, are aims in place for appropriate approvals uh, around any any disposal that there would be, and that, that would require the agreement of the Executive Office and uh, the Department of Finance. Now, I just notice uh, under the GFI rights section funding, additional $1.999 million. Why, why not two million? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid you would have to speak to uh, the Treasury and um, to ECNI because uh, ECNI identified their requirement, put it to the Treasury, and like you, when I looked at that figure, I did wonder whether there was, there was a very specific reason why it was under two million, but I'm not aware of what that is. The Treasury is just too mean to make it up to two million. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, Patrick? Thanks, Chair. Uh, you stole my question. I have an interest in you and I as well. <laughs> but any, in any event, um, Mark, thanks a lot for coming again. Uh, just in terms of, uh, I spoke a lot about COVID there. Um, did the department make a bid for uh, any funding for a, a, a COVID winter uh, publicity campaign? I mean, it seems critical to me that such a campaign would provide information for for sectors, for community, and for the public in general, so that they know what to do uh, over the over the winter months. Because uh, I mean, there seems to be quite a bit of confusion out there at the moment. Uh, yes, Pat did, uh, uh, and indeed have funded a uh, a COVID publicity uh, campaign. Um, and are looking at what the requirement might be in terms of a, a second wave. Indeed, that has been probably the, the, the largest element of expense that we as, an, as a department have incurred as a consequence uh, of this and has, is probably the main contributor to the, the pressure that we're uh, seeing at the moment, uh, to, uh, which we're bidding to the Department of Finance uh, for. Um, you're absolutely right, and the publicity is, is, and getting the message across is absolutely critical, um, and it's not cheap. Um, I think the bid was one. The overall cost was 1.9. The budget was 1.9. I think there's, there's 1.4 or so has been spent to date. Uh, so there's another five or six hundred uh, in there that, that potential. Is that That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, uh, who actually runs that campaign? Is it in house, or is it? It's the the, the executive information service would um, procure that from a, an outside provider, uh, who would do all the. Um, I'm not sure what the technical terms are, but you know, uh, uh, do all the, the, the visuals and, and, and determine the content of the campaign and look at how to pitch the message, all that sort of uh, uh, communications expertise. Okay, thanks for that. That's a good question. Thank you, uh, Pat. Um, Martine Anderson. Uh, thank you, and thank you for, for that overview in the papers. I just noticed here under the financial transaction capital. I'm just trying to work this out and understand it because it says here in the papers and of current 11, we have bid for 80 million of the financial transaction capital in relation to the Ulster University to support the Greater Belfast Development Project as part of our response to the Department for Finance recent COVID bidding exercise. I'm just trying to work out how the bid for the financial transaction capital related to the pressures from COVID. Um, they, it, we were, departments yeah. were invited to place bids for COVID-19, and at the same time, in the same paper that that was commissioned in, they invited departments to also place bids for financial transactions capital. So um, it might be a bit of a misnomer that it's not directly related to COVID-19. Okay, the way that sentence read, I thought yeah, they were both related, in the, and I yeah. couldn't work it. Work it was just the one exercise to pick up the two bits of information, I think, yeah. as, uh, oh, which okay. is if one's related to the other, but it's not really. And when you're when you're issuing the financial transaction capital, can there be conditionality attached to that? Of course, we would have to ensure there was going to be because these are loans and not grants, so they have to be paid back. But for the University of Ulster, given what we know, uh, what's happened with regards to the expenditure of the movement from one site to another and the cost that has occurred. I'm obviously quite interested, particularly in the expansion of McGee, 
and I'm wondering if there can be conditionality attached to funding like that that goes to any company that's looking to uh, a fail of it. Well, the, um, any FTC funding has to go on the basis of a business case, and the business case has to set out precisely what that is, is designed to uh, achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and associated with any business case, when the loan is put in place, there will be um, um, contractual arrangements within, within that, mm -hmm. uh, which would be overseen uh, by some sort of a, a steering committee, uh, which would be the responsibility of the relevant department. Uh, and in the case of um, the Ulster University, that, that would be the Department for the Economy, uh, okay. which I know has been in, 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 in very close contact and had very close oversight of the University of Ulster to do, to do due to diligence and ensure that all the conditions are being met and to, to look at the risks that are associated with a, um, a grant of that magnitude. Okay. Uh, can I move down to the Capital Dale? Uh, and you mentioned the Ebrington site. And you said that was for traffic management. Uh, is that an easement in the same way the cash was? Is that a return, or has that been an underspend for a project that was supposed to go in for traffic management? What what it is 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 just a delay uh, or greater time that's required to um, um, allow the investment to be to be made. So part part of the part of the provision there has to be managing the traffic into the site mm -hmm. and around the site, uh, and that's so we're we're working with the department for infrastructure on that with their responsibility for roads. Okay. So th there's been uh, a lot of work done around the traffic management element of that. And part of what we were looking at was making a contribution to some of the, the, the works that would, would be required to manage the flow. So things like roundabouts, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so so what, all, what's, what's happened there? It's just taken a bit longer to get that, for DFI to get that um, assessment in place and for that uh, investment to be able to be made. So it'll be made at a later stage. OK, but it's on, it's on stream. It's, it's, it's going to happen. It's funding will, 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 will be there whenever it's ready yeah, to be invested. Okay. Can I ask about the, the data analytical uh, functions that you talk about? And I, I speak in the context of, of the TEO uh, ministries or ministers on Monday, Tuesday, uh, when I asked the First Minister about cross-border workers. And we had heard from the public health uh, the PHA that there was a, a north-south protocol for tracking and tracing and isolation. So I'm assuming the data you would want to be part of the information that would be going to ministers would be about tracking and tracing because we're in the second wave in Derry, Shaban and Donegal and uh, at a quite an alarming rate. So uh, she was surprised and uh, the minister was, was surprised when she had heard the doctor in Lifford had said he'd never heard it and they weren't using it. So I'm wondering if this function of this uh, data is it given to ministers an overview, for instance, of the tracking of tracing of cross-border workers? Um, I, I'll have to come back to you on that. I don't know uh, the detail of all that the data analytics uh, would cover, um, but it is about drawing information from a range of sources, both across government and uh, out into arm length bodies and elsewhere, to bring it together. And as I mentioned earlier, I won't repeat it all, but in a format the ministers can quickly get to the, mm -hmm. the point and can see key pressure points or key issues that are emerging. But we'll have to come back to you on that particular point, Marty. I don't know if it mm -hmm. goes into that particular detail or not. Because it would be one pressure point, obviously, at this moment in time, given the number of people across the border every day to work or to study. And because we're having the Derry, Donegal, Japan, Lifford and the problems there, and then doctors are saying, well, the PHA is saying we have this uh, north-south protocol on tracking and tracing, and we don't know nothing about it and not using it. So if, for instance, ministers were looking to talk to people in those areas, then that kind of information would be crucial for them to get the message out, I would say. Could I ask one, one final question, an arm's length body, because I would like to the Chair to pick this up with the committee, because I would like to know uh, how many arm's length bodies there are um, under the department, and the, uh, the easement of, I think it's uh, 0.5 million. Uh, what was who, or what, or what body did that come from, or was it a few bodies? Or, but separately to that, could we also put a request, or could I could we get a request in for the arm's length bodies that fall under the EEO committee? Yeah. Well, actually, but I can give you that information now. Thank you. Um, I'll just read it into the record. Brilliant. So uh, there, there, there are nine. So there's nine. the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission, NIJAC. There's the Strategic Investment Board. There's Mays Long Cash Development Corporation. There's the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. And there's the Northern Ireland uh, Community Relations Council. There's the Victims and Survivors Service. 
There's the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. Uh, there's the Attorney General, and there's the Commissioner for Public Appointments. So that's the nine. In relation to the half a million, and my colleague could, could give you the detail, but that really came about um, as part of our, 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 our process when we went back out to the Armhouse Bodies and said, can you look harder and make sure you genuinely can spend all your money for the rest of the year? Because mm -hmm. we have this pressure, this COVID pressure that hasn't yet been met by the Department of Finance. They want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, we're bearing down as hard as we can on, on being real, realistic about our existing budgets uh, before we go to the, the centre, knowing how, how, how tight things are for funding. So that half a million came from a range of, of arms length bodies. Uh, and the one thing I think which is important, and I gave an assurance to the arms length bodies, that we were aware the circumstances were unusual this year uh, and were impacting on the capacity to spend. And the fact that they were to identify some sort of easement wouldn't be used against them next year mm -hmm. uh, on the basis that they weren't able to spend the money and therefore didn't need the budget. I think that was an important uh, assurance to give to arm health bodies. Okay, thank you. I, and I also just want to say that um, what Colin mentioned around Peace 4 funding and uh, the 8.3 million, I was shocked to see that easement coming through. I know it's only the opening allocation. Um, but to declare that kind of an uh, easement when we all know a number of groups and organisations that are trying to access and uh, especially you programmes body, particularly around this tranche of funding. But as you say, it's not lost. So, so I was glad to hear that. Thanks, uh, Martina. Can I just check with um, George and Emma? Are you still there? I'll see you. Are you still here? George, have you got anything? George, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. I'm okay, I'm okay too. I don't know if Jens can see me or hear me, but... I can see your forehead. Thank you. Um, I'm going to laugh. At this it's great, isn't it? <laughs> Mark, listen, thanks um, to you and your team for, for making yourselves available here. That was really, really useful. I, I would ask, uh, um, and when I thank you, is... is um, there is a couple of bits of information we would like to see back if we could, certainly on yeah. the, the data analytics um, breakdown and, and possibly at, at the top five investments, just so we get an, uh, a sense of, of that. And do you're happy with the answer you've got. Yeah. Yeah, on, on uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anything else, members, before, um, just to, is there anything else that we want? Are we happy enough with that bits of information that we're going to ask for? Um, Martina, you're happy with the answer you got? You don't want I am, that? I know we did have the Community Relations Council in front of us before. Mm -hmm. It was over the phone. I had asked for some information. Both of us had read yeah, yeah. some of the breakdowns and yeah. there was such a disparity between the breakdowns. I wouldn't mind at some stage it just being put on the agenda for us to return to that. That has been scheduled. That's, been scheduled. Yeah. That's okay. I'm, yeah. so, I'm happy Okay, so, so we're only asking for those two bits of information. <clears throat> yeah, on the data analytics oh, and okay. the... Um, financial transactions. Listen, um, yep. members, can I ask you um, to take your ease for five minutes because we do need to clean this down before the okay. next guests um, come in. Um, so I will suspend the, uh, the uh, sitting for five minutes for cleaning up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, welcome back uh, into live uh, session. Um, we're moving on to our next uh, set of all briefings. Uh, that's on Brexit contingency planning, preparations for a no deal uh, Brexit oral evidence session with the department officials. I refer members to page 13 of the meeting pack and page 9 of the table pack for relevant papers, including the departmental briefing paper, which was received yesterday uh, and circulated to members. Uh, at page 14 is a correspondence from the Speaker, uh, attached a copy of correspondence from the First and Deputy First Minister in relation to the delivery of the statutory instrument elements of the EU exit transition period legislation programme. All statutory committees have received this uh, correspondence. At page 33 to 35 of the table pack are the statements released by the EU and the UK governments 
following the meeting of the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee, which took place on Monday past. I advise all members that are officials in attendance today to brief on Brexit contingency planning uh, and preparation uh, for a no-deal um, Brexit. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I, I welcome uh, Andrew McCormick uh, along to, to give us a brief, the Director of International Relations of the Executive Office, uh, and Karen Pearson, um, the Director of EU Operations Readiness uh, and COVID Recovery at the Executive Office. Uh, if I can advise you both, please, that the session is being recorded by Hansard uh, and the transcript will be published uh, on the committee uh, web page. Uh, so I can just both use, welcome both of you here. Uh, this is a follow-on uh, oral session from the session that we had last week with the, the um, two junior ministers, well, which I found extremely useful and, and raised a lot of questions. Um, so if I could hand it over uh, to yourself. Thanks very much, Chair. And, uh uh, th well, thanks for the chance to be back with you again uh, on uh, an important and, and uh, challenging topic, but uh, one of which we're now gearing up to be as as well prepared as is possible. Uh, so the uh, executive has agreed that, that some, some, some time ago that we needed to look and prepare for a scenario where there's a, a non non negotiated outcome. That's a slightly awkward phrase, but it's it's not. No, no. It's not no deal because there already is a withdrawal agreement in place, uh, and uh, that's uh, only uh, being challenged at the margins in the great scheme of things. So the vast majority of the withdrawal, withdrawal agreement is definitely standing and in, and will and in force. Uh, so it, it's, it's very different from the work that we did on no deal planning for first of all for 31st of March last year, and again for 31st of October. Uh, in, in what was called Operation Yellowhammer. Uh, we did learn a lot of lessons from that work, a lot of similar themes and issues arising, and, and Karen and McKibben, myself, a, a number of us were uh, deeply involved in that process all through the back end of 2018 and all of the last year. So there's a lot of really good work done within the Executive Office and, well, more especially uh, across uh, the operational departments. So a lot of really good preparatory work was done in, in that context. So a lot, a lot we can build on. Uh, the, the fact is that then that in this scenario, uh, the, the protocol will be in place. Uh, and that, that means that we actually have in, in this jurisdiction more things that are certain uh, than is the case across the water, where the, the difference between a negotiated settlement, free trade agreement, and, and associated agreements uh, compared to a non-negotiated outcome is more acute. Uh, there are certain things that we can look at and say, well, well, we know that in relation to that issue, the protocol will apply. So that, that's actually a very, very important security factor for us. Uh, un undoubtedly, uh, the protocol will be more difficult to implement in a non-negotiated outcome than if there is a free trade agreement. Uh, so there's still an important difference uh, and very strong arguments uh, which all executive ministers are clear that the, the right thing for, for, for here uh, is to get a deal and for it to be a, a deal that embraces uh, addressing the issues of tariffs, quotas, uh, and a zero tariff, zero quota deal alongside uh, agreements with the EU on issues such as transport, uh, security, the, the, all of those things in whatever format those are, are brigaded and governed and that's one of the big sticking points in the main negotiations is how different components of, of a negotiation come together. But whatever about all of that, a, a, a good, broadly based agreement will make a, a very significant difference uh, here. Uh, so therefore, it's contingency planning. Uh, there's, uh, you know, you can um, have your own uh, crystal ball view as to what will happen in the next, what, f four or five weeks. Uh, because that's the time horizon that the main negotiations are looking at, uh, and uh, you know who knows. Um, we need to be ready for it, for whatever the outcome, and the protocol applies whatever the outcome. So there's there's a lot of challenges in that process. Uh, we've got a um, we've prepared a, a heat map dashboard, a ways of different uh, analysing all the issues. There's a very significant number of issues. Uh, we've got uh, to look at those thematically, uh, departmentally. Because uh, some, sometimes the same issue will affect different departments, uh, and that therefore needs to be analysed on a cross-cutting way. Uh, we've got uh, 
good look at, at planning assumptions. We're making some progress on that. That's, that was a bit slow to get, get into, but uh, we're making some significant progress on that. Uh, but what we, we did, I hope it was helpful in the, in the paper, uh, which, which apologies that I reached you a short time ago, but the attachment to the paper gives categorization of the issues. Uh, party to draw out the dependencies. Uh, so there are, are a, a group of issues there that were exactly how we plan and, more importantly, actually uh, precisely how businesses plan uh, will depend on the outcome of the main negotiations. So that, that's that, that first group. <coughs> There's then some very important issues that are still outstanding in relation to the interpretation and application and implementation of the protocol. Uh, there's then a number of issues that depend on, which are within the gift of London, in terms of, of how those are, are, are settled and again where we, we are, we, our role as officials working with our counterparts in London and Edinburgh and Cardiff as well and, and ministers are you know, putting the devolved perspective into those discussions to try and get the best possible outcome. And then there's a, a few things. What, I think part of the point of all of this is that there's a lot of dependent issues at the moment. As those things get resolved, and, the, and they actually must get resolved, a lot of them, in the next four or five weeks, then more issues will crystallise as issues of implementation. So the, hence the fourth category is things that are now down to us as a devolved set of institutions, as, as the institutions here, executive assembly committees, to deal with the legislation programme, uh, guidance to businesses on, on the issues that are in our, our, our control and where our role is implementation and fulfilment of obligations rather than working out what the obligations are. There's a number of areas where the obligations are not yet clear. That's difficult and challenging with less than 100 days to go, but that's, that's where we are. And I would definitely say that it's better to negotiate for a good outcome than to cut to, well, let's just implement what we, what we, what we think we know at the moment, because that would be worse than, our, worse than our, our hoped for outcome. So better to, to continue to press through these negotiations, both influencing the highest level negotiations at, at um, Frost Barnier level, uh, definitely contributing to the, in, the negotiations on the protocol, trying to get the best possible outcome. So there, there, there are technical discussions going on now. The specialised committee needs to meet again and, and form a view on some of those things. Then they need to go to the joint committee for decision. Uh, all needs to happen. So definitely worth doing that, even though that means another number of weeks of uncertainty. So, so if, that's, if given that choice, uh, do you choose bad certainty over hoped for better? I, I think that's an easy decision to take, even though it's it's actually uncomfortable. And then we then we need to then move into planning, implementation, operation as the mode of operation, probably through November and December, uh, and, and that's where maximum engagement with businesses, maximum confidence building, clear explanation, clear communication, getting that as, as sharp and as straightforward as possible for every sector and actually also for citizens, uh, given the, the very significant aspects there in the in various aspects, both of the protocol and of the withdrawal agreement. So that, that's, oh, that's a, a helpful <coughs> scene setting, uh, Karen, if there's anything she wants to add, but that, that's, that's just an attempt to put the threads together. Uh, Andy, thank you. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not easy uh, where we are at this moment in time. Um, what, what I would say is, is, is the, the point of this for us today is all about that nuclear option. That nuclear option is there is a non-negotiated outcome. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we're, we're, this is all about, is, is what preparations do we have for that um, nuclear, nuclear option. Um, and, and I guess following on from uh, our meeting last week with the junior ministers, uh, I, and also myself being on the Justice Committee that came out of the Justice Committee, is, is there any sense of there being a non-negotiated outcome working group constituted where everybody can come into it and and do joined up thinking in regards to this because speaking to the chief constable last week they're clearly talking to other departments there's clearly people talking to other departments but it all seems to be a little bit and this is just an impression i've got to say it all seems to be a little bit in isolation 
nobody is, is dragging it all together to make sure that we're all walking in the same direction. Does that make sense? So there, there is a working group, a working group met this morning. Uh, we've had that regularly for the last uh, month or, or more. And uh, we're nearly ready to open up that group to a, a wider attendance, including PSNI uh, and local government, uh, as would be conventional in any planning system, planning approach of this of this nature, where we're dealing with uh, contingency planning that stretches from policy making and decision making through to very much uh, practical operational issues. So, so that that's the part of the reason we've we've not been ready for that is because. There are so many things on the first part of that page that are still contingent and uncertain, and, and also we, were, we still have to bring forward and, and clear at executive level what are, what's the guidance from ministerial level on the planning assumptions that we adopt. We know, what, we know a bit more than we did about the planning assumptions at uh, London level. That, that's, that's now a lot clearer to us. It's then translating that into our context, making sure that works. Uh, and, and looking at uh, all the dimensions, so we're, we're, uh, there, there is a group. Uh, it, it will be widened soon. It's just not, we're just not quite ready to make that point just yet. But that's clear intent uh, that that would involve um, the wider group, and would also then keep close link to um, the work that Karen is leading on uh, the issues in relation to contingency planning and, and management in relation to COVID, and then the, the classic. Uh, civil contingencies role that is always there uh, in relation to uh, ordinary events, uh, winter pressures um, or weather events and, and things like that. So is that again, please? I think it's important just to um, focus on one thing Andrew said in his opening, which is we've, we've done this once already in Operation Yellowhammer. This is very, very different um, because there are still some uncertainties and the outcome may look different, but the, the planning methodology the ability of departments to work together. We've brought, pretty much brought that group back together, Mr. BT, and that's, it's working reasonably well. Um, we'd like to be further on, no doubt, but there are still some unknowns and, uh, and gaps in our knowledge we need, to, we need to fill. But absolute commitment that local government and PSNI and food standards, yes, food standards and, and um, will be in that group as, as quickly as we can. Chair? Uh, Andrew, can I just ask, I, I don't want to labour it, but, but I'll be honest with you, at this stage, I mean, you know, first of October tomorrow, you know, we are really at the end game here. Um, I, I'm slightly concerned that, that we haven't widened that group yet. Who's on it at the minute? Who chairs it at the minute? Who's on that group as so, we speak? Uh, I, I would chair, I chair it, but, but uh, there, are, there are representatives from all the, all the departments. Right. And we also then also separately have uh, a liaison arrangement with NIO, so we link into what's going on at UK government level. Uh, we're also strongly linked into the Cabinet Office um, portfolio, transition Portfolio Board, which looks at the range of planning issues across the whole of the UK. So, so th th there are, there's a good, I think, a good structure in place, uh, and we're, we're, we're moving, for, moving it forward. And I think it's maybe just worth drawing out. You mentioned a nuclear option. There's a spectrum, even within a non-negotiated outcome. There's still uh, a spectrum of possibilities, mainly based on the issues in, on, in Section Two of the attachment to the paper, as in depending how the, how the protocol negotiations turn out, because uh, the, the, one of the reasons that, that, that we'd have difficulty in a non-negotiated outcome would be in the absence of a free trade agreement. But if we had good, good and uh, helpful arrangements agreed with the European Commission on the, on the implementation of the protocol, that, t that would take a lot of those difficulties away. So, so there's, there's a still actually Part of the reason that we're not fully fully into planning and impl implementation mode, and uh, is because there are still genuinely important things to to, to play for, and, and that's that's absolutely worth pursuing. Uh, and, and, and you're right, because there are knowns and there are knowns yeah. and there are known unknowns <laughs> yes. and there are unknown unknowns. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I get that. Yeah, you, you, you it. But can I just press on that one issue, please, uh, Andrew? When it's widened, yep. will it be ministerial led? Um, is that the level we're talking about here? Because to me, you'd expect it to be. I mean, this is so critical to us uh, in the future. Would that working group be ministerial-led? So, uh, I think the, the, the work will be overseen by the executive and, and everything we do uh, and all, all this work is being, <coughs> is being reported to and, 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 and reported to um, junior ministers and to FM and DFM. We haven't planned a structure in that way. 
uh, but uh, I think it partly depends how some of these things resolve themselves, yeah. and we also need to link into the way in which uh, CCG, CCG works. Uh, that, that's an important point, as, and I think there's still some things we need to pick up following uh, something that um, was drawn, uh, the, the review of the C3 arrangements that uh, Minister Kearney mentioned last week. So there's work, there's work for us to do and exactly yeah. what to do, but you know, the, the point, point is, whatever happens, uh, the decision-making on uh, planning assumptions, the direction of the work uh, will, will be you know, absolutely clearly a ministerial responsibility. And, and can I just ask very briefly before I hand it, hand it out to the, to the rest of the committee, do, do you have any, and I don't want to hold you to this, but I'm just actually just trying to get a sense of it, do you have any target times for those planning assumptions? Is there a target time where you say, look, and if I don't have this by now, this is what I've got to do? Well, I think the, the reality is that, that so much depends on the, on the negotiation timetable uh, where we, you know, the Prime Minister's line was to say that the main negotiations needed resolved by 15th of October. There's European Council uh, later October. So I, I think that the um, what I would say is that uh, by the end of October, uh, a lot of things will have crystallised and, and we'll, we'll know much more clearly where I stand. I would be, you know, anything we can do in our discussions with London to push for resolution of the protocol issues, and that's happening. There are technical discussions going on this week, next week, with the Commission, which are going in that direction. I, th I think, uh, anyway, I would venture, okay, <laughs> around end October is, a, is a, probably a turning point. If things aren't, aren't clear by then, I think we, we re re really would need to be being a different tack. And every and on all, I'm just you know all the questions I'm asking Andrew is is based on the fact that that it's all not worked. It's all fallen down. We have a non-negotiated outcome, and that's I mean that's my real concern, and that's what I'm trying to drive into because yep. some people will see that as a, a real uh, possibility. But listen, thank you for your answers. I'm going to hand over to to Colin now, if I can. Okay, thank you very much, sir, and thank you to Andrew for the presentation. Um, I suppose maybe Andrew uh, and look, all of this is predicated on the fact that it's it's not you know waiting on determinations of 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 um, negotiations is not really anything that you can control. Um, so none of these questions, in a way, are a sense at trying to attribute blame. But could you give me a flavour of how many of the items are binary in the sense that if you get a deal, then X happens if you don't get a deal, Y happens, and therefore, if the items are binary, can preparations be made for either outcome, or is it a case that with the majority of the issues that are being negotiated, that they are spectrum based? So it depends where the actual outcome lands, which then dictates what your next action is if you have to prepare for a negotiated or non-negotiated outcome. It, it, which of those two scenarios would be in the majority? Um, I think it's, if you'll forgive a civil service answer, it's somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me, let me uh, uh, just expand on that a little bit because uh, there's lot, lots of, the, the thing is that there are quite a few points where the individual item leads to a binary choice, but we've got a combination of issues here. So if you take, Take, um, I think one of the most prominent ones would be the treatment of goods moving from GB to NI, and the, the, so there, there you've got the, the first level point is will there be a deal? On, and, and, okay, assuming there's, there's no major free trade agreement, then we've got an issue around what's the tariff policy at UK level? What's the inter interaction of EU and UK tariffs? So, so we come down that side of that binary choice, and, but then the question is. Will there be a good and positive outcome to the discussions on address goods, which means that uh, where the objective from uh, our side of the negotiations is to um, minimise or eliminate to, to the greatest extent possible anything being treated as at risk and therefore keep the flow as, as smooth as possible. I think everyone would be united that that's highly desirable. And then we have the controversial proposal in the Internal Market Bill that, that the UK would, would unilaterally decide to do it that way. Uh, now, that's that's you know th there is 
uh, that that's problematic. But just, you know, from the from the other point of view, uh, the question is, uh, what's what's entering the single market? What's affecting uh, potential distortions of trade? Uh, you know, the way that might be abused. So that that's that, the, the, the there's a, a, another binary outcome there, uh, and actually maybe that's maybe that one isn't even binary. Maybe that's that's got a gradation from very extensive. Uh, very, very complicated at-risk rules to uh, a highly successful outcome where hardly anything is treated as at-risk. At so that, that that one's that, that's and that's only one of I don't know ten or fifteen sets of choices. So there's the, I think the outcome of all of that is there's a spectrum between very best possible application of non-negotiated outcome to uh, I guess what we'd call reasonable worst case, and so. The, the responsible thing for us to do is to look at reasonable worst case and build our plans around that. And that's that's probably what was clear in the uh, in the Michael Gove correspondence that was was commented on last week. And that that's that's and that was what we did in in Yellowhammer. To look at reasonable worst case, and you know even in in that there are cost issues that arise. But I think it, it's also it's a reasonable worst. It's not very worst case. Very worst case takes you into some of the. Uh, alarmist stories, but they are alarmist and un unnecessarily alarmist because uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a bit of good faith, common sense. Those are obligations on all sides in the negotiations. So, worst case, reasonable worst case, uh, should still keep a lot of things moving and flowing. Uh, you know, essentials will, will be fine uh, in any scenario. Uh, there may be some cost issues to deal with, and that's one thing that the executive is very focused on. So, uh, sorry. Complicated answer to, but but I hope it's yep. uh, a fabulous civil service answer to the question there. Thank you for that. But I, I get what you're saying. But again, if 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 what you're um, suggesting there is that there's a spectrum of uh, boiling it down to a good outcome, a bad outcome, and then an outcome that's kind of in the middle, and you're kind of aiming for the one that's in the middle. But what I'm hearing you say there, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that even in preparing for the middle outcome, which is reasonable worst outcome, that there are just about the basics that we will be ready for by the 1st of January, which means that there will be a considerable amount of preparations that won't be ready. And that's at a reasonable bet, a reasonable worst outcome. If we were to have a bad end of the worst outcome, we're just not going to be ready for anything by the 1st of January. What happens? Well, that, that, that Absolutely, should not happen, and, and there is time uh, and will uh, okay. to avoid that. And that, no, that, that would be, uh, that's where the hardest questions would arise in relation to, especially the flow of essential goods, highly highly regulated goods. So there's, there's lots of technical issues that need to be resolved in all of that. But I, I know, reasonable worst case, I would I would not not suggest that's the middle. I think that's that's towards the bad end. Uh, but it's, it's looking at the spectrum of of reasonableness. Uh, I, I think we have to make sure that, that uh, we, we have a responsible set of plans and then are looking at uh, helping um, helping businesses, helping those in, in logistics, uh, in transport, uh, to be ready and geared up. Uh, because they're, what, as, as I think the, the concerning thing, and this applies at, at, across uh, all parts of it uh, that are affected is businesses aren't, aren't as ready as they could be and should be. Uh, that's partly because there's been so much uncertainty and there is a need for clear messaging that says, you know, whatever else may happen, you need to be ready for these steps. Uh, there, there are steps that, that everyone needs to take, uh, a lot of which are actually certain and where I think we need to work with London uh, and work alongside the other devolved administrations in getting clear and straightforward messages that, that whatever happens, this is going, this is going to change. Uh, and that's part of what uh, some of the UK government uh, communications campaigns have been about, saying, be ready for these things, because what, wherever we fit, settle on the spectrum, whether it's negotiated, uh, difficult, or, or what, there are, there are a lot of things that need to be done. And, and, and certainly people should, should not be saying, oh, uh, It'll wait. Uh, there'll be some kind of pause period. There, there's no no reason to expect a, a, any kind of um, pause. But no, there's no there, there is no chance of extension of transition, and it won't feel like extension of transition. It'll feel like 
of quite a radical change, uh, even if even if some things and and uh, on the on the border model, for example, uh, again this this is not so relevant to us, but looking at that from GB EU trade, you know they're they're uh, phasing some things in, and that will uh, you know just be it's a, it's a sign that that no one's completely ready and and. Uh, this needs, I need to be recognising that and, and adjusting to that. I suppose, um, but saying that we need to be ready and preparedness, and that there's campaigns that need to be launched for information. That you know that continues to be very, very worrying. Given that it is the first of October tomorrow, you know how the departments and cross devolved regions get together to prepare and plan those and have them ready so that businesses are then prepared by the first of January, and there being no slippage in that date. Um, is very tight, but if I could just ask briefly, and, and, and it would be difficult to give a brief uh, view on this, but given that the protocol agreed leaves us in the north following um, guidelines within the EU standards and directives, the internal market bill that was is, is progressing is going to allow for a divergence from them to, to products that come here, which is going to cause a massive difficulty. To me, that is just a, a, a circle that can't be squared what, what 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 consideration has been given to the impact of the internal market bill on already negotiated outcomes stuff that has been banked as we've dealt with that we've thought it through we know what we're doing and now at this late stage it's just blown back open again has there been conversations discussions or preparations for the outcome of that um, at the risk of Using the unfortunate phrase, I mean the proposals are relatively limited in terms of the actual effect on the protocol. Uh, the actual the, the the clauses in the bill that impact directly are in relation to the aspect of state aid that involves not state aid rules that will apply to, to to firms and businesses based here, but the concept of reach back, as in where where um, companies trading with or in or through Northern Ireland uh, are the, the attempt is to exclude them from the scope of the protocols provisions in relation to state aid and, that, that, and that's that's narrowly what that that aspect of, is all about and so the the intent is it doesn't change uh, the there, there are very very large areas of the protocol that are not not changed at all by the internal market bill uh, the other bit that, that has been announced but not yet progressed is the proposed provisions in the finance bill which won't come won't come until they're ready to bring it forward uh, which would be affecting the point I was talking about earlier in terms of definition of at-risk goods those are the, the elements sorry, the, the, the other one is the exclusion of the obligation to have exit declarations sorry that's the that's the other uh, provision in the product uh, that is and that's on NI to GB movement of goods so so the, the um, the actual substantive uncertainties arising from the internal market bill are specific and limited, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, that, that doesn't take away the materiality or the significance of what's happened. Uh, but in terms of the actual substantive impact on business planning, uh, it's it's not so great. Uh, it, it, it won't change the uh, the fact that the uh, the, the, the there'll be. You know, the fundamentals of the protocol, which include uh, access for Northern Ireland businesses to the EU market, because there's no, there's nothing, and uh, there is no land border. So, so there's, there's there's total openness of trade for Northern Ireland businesses into the, into the EU. Uh, the, the bill then does promote uh, unfettered access of Northern Ireland goods into the GB market. Uh, it, also, it tries to address the issues of um, non-discrimination. Uh, and, and if, you know, good providing for competitiveness in, in that context. Again, th these are uh, good, good and positive intentions behind aspects of the bill. That doesn't mean it's comp doesn't mean it isn't complicated, and there aren't other hazards around. But actually, in terms of the, the substantive uncertainties, they're not so great. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Colin. Um, uh, Trevor Lund then Martina. Um, right. Um, thanks for your presentations. I, I wouldn't want to delay the committee by saying much about this. It'll be the same as what I've said for the last six months. 
Um, and I appreciate your saying there are some positive aspects to all this and there's working on behind the scenes and at, at your level that gives you some hope that will not be cut loose and stranded at the end of the year. But then I look at the report from Mr. Sefcevic on the meeting on Monday and then look at Ma Michael Gove's response. <laughs> I, just, I just think, where is the common ground here? There isn't any. You know, they just, just say exactly the opposite things. Mr. Sefcevic is stressing the withdrawal agreement to be implemented, not renegotiated, not unilaterally changed, disregarded or disapplied. But that's pretty much what the British government has in mind. And then and Michael Gove's response, will finish with this. He says, uh, first of all, he, he reiterates the importance of commitment on both sides to upholding the obligations under the withdrawal agreement. Right. <laughs> He said, he goes on to the internal market bill and he said, the UK is clear that the measures which Europe wants to be dealt with will not be withdrawn. End of story. Where, where, you know, where, where will we go from there? Um, I think you can take us a comment, I don't mind. Well, that, that question's definitely above my pay grade in terms of, of uh, you know, how that gets sorted out. That's, that's uh, you know, very, very, probably above uh, measures uh, Seth Goodrich and Gove to sort out. Because that, that's about how this, this, this whole thing settles uh, and there is there's you know a clear tension. Uh, I think what is, is striking is that there remains process of negotiation happening and to the extent that uh, the issues that are, are in play actually get resolved. You know, if, if the at-risk goods issue gets resolved between the, the technicians uh, an acceptable solution emerges, that's that's still possible. Yeah. In, in which case that, that, that bit becomes unnecessary, whether it was necessary for them to proceed as they did in the bill and even in the plans for the finance bill, that's uh, way above uh, my level of discussion. Uh, you know, I, I can't comment on that, but what, what I can say is that there is a process of discussion which, uh, if it leads to a satisfactory outcome, can still take us to the right place uh, on address goods, uh, on, on s subsidy and state aid, which has always been really at the heart of all of this in terms of, of, of how, uh, how, um, you know, how economies compete. And that, that's a you know, global point. Uh, mm. It's relevant to every free trade agreement in the world. So that, that, that's all, uh, in a way, it's maybe not surprising that there's that kind of fairly ferocious exchange at this stage of a process. And it, it certainly doesn't lead me to conclude, well, you know, game over, it's not going to happen. Uh, there is still a, it's still the possibility. It might not, uh, you know. It, it might. Who, I don't know what they intend, but uh, the possibility of agreement is there, uh, and would be highly beneficial from all, all points of view if agreement can be reached on, on acceptable terms. Will there be another meeting of the joint committee before the end of October? Yes, I'm, I'm be confident there will be. I think there there uh, there the, 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 the first there needs to be probably a specialised committee, and. Uh, but, but prior to that, uh, you know, the real work on these things, as in any European process, uh, you know, um, I've, I've been on the periphery of European business for nearly 40 years. It's all, it's all, it's always worked out in small technical <coughs> discussions between officials that, that, you know, with under a political mandate, arrangements are sorted out. You know, and colleagues have seen this time and time again, and then it comes to the formal process. Uh, be it to, you know it used to be to co ripper or whatever on the U European Council, but that, that's you know, that's the kind of thing people do and have done and know how to do um, in the great scheme of things. Yeah, well, I think Martina perhaps would know more about that than I do. But what you're saying has really nothing to worry about. Uh, oh, oh, no, uh, 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 <laughs> stretching me too far there. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Martina. Trevor, you have plenty to worry about, unfortunately, and, uh, and I think it, you're intelligent enough to know that. Um, I think it's worth reminding us all that this uh, Yellowhammer, Operation Yellowhammer, is now being held up as something that officials had worked on and now will work something similar process going forward. When Operation Yellowhammer was presented, leaked to Joe and Jane Public, <coughs> the British government denied it. They, first of all, uh, Michael Gove had said that um, that there was a watered-down version of it, as I would call it. They wouldn't even 
uh, really sad. And why would they not release it? Because it showed that there would be a shortage of food, a shortage of fuel, a shortage of medicine. Chemicals would not be able to be processed and purchased in the same supply chain. We've had the Department for Infrastructure tell us at the event of a no deal that it will cost more. Lorries will be delayed for two and a half days, half a day of ports, and the chaos continues. So unfortunately, as we are told by October, it's over because the European Parliament and 28 other governments and countries have to you know, give their imprimatur to uh, a future relationship. The clock is ticking and tomorrow we go into the 1st of October and we're one month away. So I am concerned um, <laughs> now that we're talking about Operation Yellowhammer as the basis upon which uh, we are working towards um, looking at the reasonable worst case scenario in page 10. So if that's the reasonable worst case scenario, we have the information about Operation Yellowhammer, uh, Chair, we can go and get that, we can get our understanding of that, and that can explain it all to, to everyone that, uh, that would be concerned um, about that. They also, the British government, had recognised at that time that they would expect a harder border in Ireland in the context uh, of no future relationship with the EU. So when you talk about the obligations on both sides, and you say it, you know, reasonable people here, and we would hope we would, you know, wishes are for Christmas, we'd hope we get a better outcome. From your professional civil servant's position, does the Internal Market Bill break international law? I think that's a question for a lawyer. Uh, the, the lawyers... Well, we have heard lawyers. Yes. We've heard from the you know, Attorney General, we've heard from other people talk about um, how it does break international law. But are we in a situation well, then where civil servants are being asked to implement the breach of international law? So, uh, in, in fairness, the original statement by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland was acknowledging that uh, there were specific and limited breaches of international law. So, in that sense, that's what he said. Yes, yeah. only a little bit. Um, the, um, there is no, no problem or issue in relation to civil servants working in Northern Ireland at this point because uh, the legal framework we work under is all flowing from uh, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Act. So ev because everything that is done in this place, uh, in the North-South institutions and so on, flows from that le le legislation that, that governs what we can and cannot do, both at ministerial and departmental level. So, so there's, there's nothing like the risk or issue that might apply for those who are working in London, where uh, the argument of the UK government is that Parliament is sovereign. And if Parliament legislates, that sovereignty applies. Uh, and and that, that's the essence of um, the Attorney General's argument in London as the essence of what they've, they've brought forward publicly as the way that's being handled. So that, that's for them. That does not affect us directly uh, in, in these institutions because these institutions are, are created by uh, the agreement and the Northern Ireland Act as, as successively amended following a further agreement. So that, that's, that keeps us in that sense uh, straightforward and it means that there is no, no challenge or hazard in relation to uh, our obligations, uh, we and uh, ministers in the executive North -South, North South institutions only have the power to do what those provisions provide for them to do, and anything else would be ultra various. So that, that, that's <coughs> a much more straightforward legal context than applies to uh, what is going on through the Internal Market Bill. So let's look then at the Good Friday Agreement and the functionality of this assembly. And you have a finance minister telling you that this internal market bill overrides the authority of this assembly and his authority. So yes, that, that's, a, that's a different part of the bill. Well, it's a different part of the bill, but it's still, I, I wasn't actually only going into sections of the bill. I was yeah, talking about it in its, in its totality. So um, given that, that that is the case theoretically, we could have a situation where state aid rules would enable uh, a British minister uh, to override the authority 
of the Finance Minister. So, for instance, we've already gone through the RHI scandal, but we could have a minister deciding that they will bypass the Finance Minister and give funding to a preferred business without having to have the authority of the Assembly, um, the Executive or the Finance Minister, in theory, for state aid rules that can happen. Um, I think I'm not sure that's novel in the sense that uh, the Northern Ireland Act, nothing in the Northern Ireland Act took away from parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, I, th I think there's a clause in the Northern Ireland Act that allows for uh, Westminster to legislate in relation to issues in Northern Ireland in any case. Uh, the provision that, that is, uh, it takes us into the Department of Finance locus in the UK Internal Market Bill is that's the one that is most controversial with uh, Scotland and Wales because that, that is being argued as overthrowing, um, if that's not too strong a word, really challenging the, the, part, the, the whole principle of devolution. Uh, at which, on, under which uh, devolved budgets are used by the devolved institutions, and so, so it is an, a, it's a, a new provision for UK government to uh, uh, invest or undertake expenditure in, in um, devolved country in the devolved regions on their own behalf. So that, that's that's highly controversial. It, it's I think differently controversial from the, the, the state aid provisions in clauses 40 to 45 of the bill. The, the, the clause dealing with the financial power is um, it's a, it's a different controversy. Uh, and I don't think there's any, that, that's, not, not, that's not where the breach or the potential breach of international law would be. It is uh, argued by the Scots and the Welsh in particular, and I think also by uh, ministers here as challenging the principle of devolution and therefore you know, highly objectionable in those terms. But it's, it's a different dispute. If I'm well, it's a, it's, right. it's a breach to the Good Friday Agreement, which is also an international agreement that is uh, lodged to the United Nations. So it's a breach to the uh, to the default powers of this Assembly. So um, it's it's uh, six of one and a half dozen the other. One might argue it's two international agreements being breached. In relation to, if you were to take workers, families, communities, if there, for instance, in a few weeks' time, if we're going over a cliff and there's no future relationship, and all the tampering that has taken place with both the functionality of here and the protections that had been the obligations um, in the protocol, where would that leave the um, workers, for instance? Um, there's 30,000 people who cross the border every day to work and to study. Uh, where would that leave if there were a harder border in Ireland? Where does that leave the protections? Now, we know about trade. We know about cows and sheep and the protections that were given in the agreement there. But we also want about the human beings and their rights upheld. And given that the Charter of Fundamental Rights scrapped. So families and communities and workers, how are the people going to be impacted on the reasonable worst-case scenario? So, um, I think even beyond a reasonable worst-case, even at the worst-case, there is hardly any impact in terms of moving the people uh, across the border. That's, that's because uh, the overriding commitment uh, from both governments is to the common travel area. Yeah, but th that's not in law. We uh, know that's, it's, it's, there's, there's that's, a, that hasn't been codified in law, so therein lies another problem. Yes. Uh, however, there, there's no indication of anything that's undermining that. that that's been uh, built into the um, working assumptions and, and the whole basis of planning from uh, right from the beginning of this whole process. Uh, so uh, th there is, um, and, and, and also, you know, there's, it's not that not there's anything arising from the, the internal market bill that takes us back towards the risk of a land border. That, that's, that's not lands. Uh, the issue, issue is, is, is much more limited uh, in terms of its scope. Uh, the, you know, the, the state aid provisions are the at-risk. Oh, those, those are to be resolved, but um, I would say that the uh, even in relation to goods or trade, uh, there is no sign of a risk to the fundamentals of why the protocol was agreed in, in terms of avoiding a hard border. Look, look, as you say, then in relation to workers, 
uh, families, um, even in the status quo, there are uh, there there are hardly any constraints or checks uh, on the movement of people. Uh, there would be a change in the in some of the status quo is not going to maintain. It's not going to be uh, like we had the transition, where people didn't notice really any difference when we moved from being kicked out of the EU because there was a transition. It's not going to be that smooth running process as we hit the end of this year. There's but, going to be a difference. But they, they, people are going to feel a difference. They're going to experience a difference. But, uh, not not through checks on people crossing the land border. That's that's not going to happen. Uh, partly because the CTA applies, partly because it's also just far too controversial and, and impractical. Uh, both of those apply, and also there are uh, good, good fundamental working relationships between the British and Irish governments in relation to uh, the way uh, immigration is managed and, and handled. Uh, that's that's uh, long standing uh, and is based on the CTA. But I'm not sure if Karen can add to this from, from your justice background, but I, I, do, I just see uh, this as um, not uh, a high-risk area. There's a need, a need to look at, 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 at ensure ensure that uh, the aspects of, of working you know, people who, who work in one jurisdiction and live in another that that's that's handled handled out. But for for British and Irish citizens, uh, the, the common travel area creates those entitlements, and the, and those will be honoured. I, I see no no threat or risk to those entitlements. I, I can't think of anything in particular, but your point, does it does it feel different? Yes, of course, because we're out and um, some people will feel very strongly about that. But in terms of the protocol and the arrangements in place, I can't think of anything specific that's going to get in, in the way of, of the movement. Child care? You, if you live in one, I'm just throwing that out as an example. You live in one side of the border, your social security, um, regulations, all of that there is going to be applied, are you saying, across uh, Ireland? Education, health, social security are all within mm -hmm. the scope of the common travel area. And even though they're not in law yet, yeah, so it's yes, just the hope there. that those commitments yes. would be honoured. That's right. That's, that's so we'll clear keep fingers crossed. Absolutely clear expectation that that, that that will be sustained and not give rise to difficulty. Okay, you will forgive people for being somewhat sceptical no, or worried. I, I totally understand. Could I ask, say just finally, Chair, page uh, 13 of the information we received, and it related to um, certainty that the um, Minister for the Economy is saying she requires in order for her to engage with business about what is coming down the track or potentially at the end of this year. Do you also confirm that to me? that since COVID she hasn't really been engaging with uh, businesses because she, there's a lack of certainty. Um, she doesn't know how this is all going to play out. So for a minister to not be engaging with businesses and, and given what it's saying in, in page 13 with regards to um, how businesses are, have to plan and they, they don't have any direction um, about planning and you have a minister saying that she's not engaging with them until she gets certainty, uh, and clarity, then surely all of that is adding to the concern and the chaos that could emerge, but particularly the concern that people are feeling at this moment in time, and particularly businesses. So businesses have raised consistently, pers persistently, uh, a whole range of concerns and have made a very concerted set of efforts to seek out clarity. The main source of that clarity is the um, outcome of the negotiations between the between London and Brussels. So that, that's where that's where the uh, uncertainties lie, and that's the only place they can be resolved. And hence, in fact, I was saying earlier about the process of resolving those issues in the next three in the next few weeks. That 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 has to happen. Uh, and the other very constructive thing is that uh, the business community have not not just sat and asked questions and complained. They have been very thoughtful and innovative in putting forward ideas and suggestions and proposals uh, to us, to DFE, uh, to DERA, uh, to uh, NIO and to the Cabinet Office uh, as to you know, how things might work out. And that's, in fairness, that's also part of how the NIO proceeded after the publication of the command paper in May. They referred there to the creation of the Business Engagement Forum and several of those discussions were uh, were described as co-design. So they're saying to the business community, 
And here's an aspect of the implementation of the protocol that is quite complicated. What do you as businesses think would be the best solutions? So that, that's been going on. Uh, a lot of people have worked very constructively on that. Uh, pay tribute to the, the, the <coughs> business group who have led that work. They have engaged faithfully and, and you know, very creatively in trying to, trying to work on, on solving problems. So it's, it's by, by so no means easy. We've been involved in that, uh, the officials. But has the Department for Community brought forward any contingency plans based on the worst case scenario, given that that is we, what we are working at at the moment, the reasonable worst case scenario, whatever that looks like, um, is the Department for Community, or has the Department for Community, the Minister, brought forward any proposals as to how that could help businesses start to plan, given um, that that's the context through which now you are building whatever you're building going forward. So uh, th it's still a work in progress because the, the, there are pretty fundamental aspects, as in the, as in the attachment to the paper, that, that genuinely are not resolved. And to, to say to businesses, do this and not that, when it might be better to do it a different way. At this stage, that would not be the right thing. Okay, well, I'll take that as a no. It's not your fault, it's but not, I take that as a place, no. It's not the ideal place, but it's still better than rushing to implement and plan for a, a, a worse outcome than may be delivered. That's, well, you're better I'm being holding, prepared, prepared at least no. if you're, you've got a contingency plan in place. Well, if you don't have to implement it, if it's not as bad as that, but sure, that's one thing. But you, at least you have a contingency plan in place in the event of a backstop. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think in fairness, I would say that that, uh, that larger companies will, will have done exactly that. And that they have the capability well, the companies that. Been working large on companies, their own. yes. Yeah. Small companies, especially with the extreme uncertainties arising from the virus, uh, you know, just don't have the capacity to do that, and it would be unfair to, to do that. So and that's that where that the Minister for the Economy is crucial in her engagement with those businesses to help them navigate their way through this potential outcome. So I think uh, Invest and I and Interdead Ireland would probably have a, quite a lot to say on that. I, I, I don't know more detail on that, but I think there has been some, some good engagement work, obviously, on, under the Minister's direction. I can, if I just move us on now, Pat. Okay, and just a quick one, Andrew. Thanks for all you've told us so far. I'm just wondering, in this no deal planning process, uh, has there been any uh, involvement of the Dublin government or Dublin officials outside of the main negotiations between the, the, the British government and the EU? Yes, uh, we're, we're in touch regularly with colleagues in the, uh, in the Irish government and uh, are work working well on. There are specific provisions in the protocol for North-South cooperation. Uh, there are logistical issues that are best dealt with and, and are being dealt with between the respective operational departments. So I'm, I'm aware of good contact, for example, on the transport uh, field. So absolutely, there's, there's definitely more to be done. Uh, and uh, you know, while while they were in government formation mode, things were moving more slowly. But but uh, that's picking up uh, and. There are also, you know, important opportunities that lie ahead in, in continuing to work on a north-south basis. Uh, and one possible way forward, if there are some issues not resolved in main negotiations, uh, when the European Council approved uh, the withdrawal agreement in January, um, there was a, a, a provision made in the Council conclusions in January that allows um, member states affected to make proposals for bilateral arrangements with the UK, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a possible way forward it, and it applies to, to Spain in relation to Gibraltar, it applies to Cyprus in relation to the uh, British sovereign bases in Cyprus, so, so uh, there is a, a, a power there which can, could be invoked uh, to settle something on a bilateral basis between uh, Dublin and, and, um, and London, which could be something relevant to what we need uh, here. So, uh, yes, sorry, it's a, a long yes. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Emma, do you have any questions? Emma, we're not hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything we can do? No, she's okay. <laughs> she's all right. Are you looking in? <laughs> if I can do it. <laughs> she's okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll say no. <laughs> George, do you have any questions? 
self-explanatory so far, just in a listening mode. Um, okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay, th thank you. Um, so I'm taking that's all, all of the questions. Um, Andrew Carr, thank you very much for that. I mean, I thought that was really, really useful and uh, and and some good answers. I mean, it, it does always and it always will do kick up more questions, and, and yeah. you know we, we'll have to revisit this again. But um, thank you very much for for, uh, for coming along. Thank you for taking the time and being uh, as honest as you can with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russian indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, before we do move, on, is there any uh, is there anything uh, off the back of that that we would like to ask for any more information on the that or um... it might be useful in terms of Pat's question or well, might more the response, maybe to see what look, that work looks like between Dublin and there because I mean it, that, that's probably news to most of us that that's mm -hmm. I mean I, let's be honest it does look like we're heading for a no data, so mm -hmm. if we are it's actually interesting that that work's going on it'd be nice to see. What that looks like. What's the form and the shape of it? What's yeah. it about? Yeah. What's the issues? Yeah. Could we ask for that just mm -hmm. to sort of get yeah. a bit of an idea, a bit of a breakdown? It might not be as detailed as we want, but it'll give us a better idea of what. Well, we're I think that was encouraging to hear that's actually taking place. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, there's 156 areas of, you know, all Ireland yeah, cooperation yeah. outside of the Good Friday Agreement, so it would be good to know if, uh, if that work is still continued. Maybe we, uh, we can invite them up to the party when we leave, Martina. <laughs> yeah. um, They're inviting you down. <laughs> We're already left. It feels like it was a, good, it was a good, good question session, I thought, um, and I thought there was good information out there. If we move on to item uh, six uh, of the meeting pack, which is the forward work program, uh, if I can refer okay. members to page um, 21 okay. uh, of the okay. meeting pack for the forward work program, uh, we are still waiting a response for the department on the progress for each of the work strands under the new decade. A new approach, which falls within the remit of the executive uh, office, um, you know, we, we have tried. Uh, we requested this information on the 3rd of July, uh, and despite uh, a reminder, uh, we have not yet received uh, an answer. Uh, therefore, I suggest that an oral evidence session is scheduled so that members can get that update by questioning. Uh, are we content that we do so? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Good. Um, if I can also tell uh, members that the bre Brexit. A uh, stakeholders event, if you remember, we thought it would be useful to do a, a Brexit stakeholders mm -hmm. event at the last meeting. Uh, and we originally said for the border um, council areas, but then we decided for all council areas. Um, that, that has been arranged for Wednesday, the 4th of November, okay. uh, and invite, invites have been issued to all councils. Council have been asked to confirm by the 9th of October, uh, and two councils have already confirmed, uh, Derry City and Straban and Fermanagh uh, and Oma uh, have confirmed so far. Uh, but I can, can, can I just advise that to comply with social distancing guidelines, uh, this event will take place in three separate rooms um, with three committee members and two council representatives in each room. Council will each be allocated a 30 minute slot, 10 minutes to address members and 20 minutes for questions uh, and answers. Uh, are we content with the, uh, the work programme and for that? It's going to be somewhat chaotic going from three rooms, but of course we have to try and service it. Yeah. I, I mean, given that we're in this mode of changing mm -hmm. the way we do business mm -hmm. here, there would be no opportunity to use the chamber. The decision hasn't been made yet on use of the chamber, but if we could maybe outline um, what we're planning is, so you'll have three rooms, you'll have the committee split into three and two members from each council coming in. Um, and obviously we'll try and match up members to your own council area because we'll want to be hearing from your councils so and then we can bring all the information together I mean, how to put this diplomatically ahead, i'm not sure that, that actually works uh, i mean i would be happy even if we get another venue outside of this building to get everybody in the one room i think to be fair to other members whilst martina is mad keen to show us where this place there is at i mean i always want to go london i actually would like to hear what they've got to say as well i would like you to come to my hometown whatever you call it um, but, I, but i would like i think it's just for the members here the perspective from other areas as opposed oh, to just their own okay and, 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 that, and that makes per perfect sense so so i guess just, i guess what we're looking at is a larger venue so that we yeah. get everybody mm -hmm. in i mean you know i'll try and find a venue then that will accommodate Huge, well, not a huge number in norm, but in these circumstances, it's quite a, a large number. What are we talking top, top number? You're talking 22 people. 
from 11 councils, you're talking nine committee members, you're talking a couple of committee staff. So, so there are there are some council uh, or council facilities which are large enough to, to, to do that. Um, uh, Quigavon, for example, has a very large room to be mm -hmm. able to do that, and it's okay. just right from where I live. So I'm for that. <laughs> well, I think, I'm, I'm well, I think Chair Dicey here, oh, here from all, I mean, your area of the were, uh, mine. Yeah, that's why I would like to hear from your area uh, as well. Is I would like to hear from other areas course, as well absolutely. as my own rather than I mean, that's why I appreciate it would, would appreciate being there obviously to engage with those from the Derry area but I would also want to hear from other oh. councils mm -hmm. their no. experience oh, okay well. so listen I'll take it away uh, is anybody online who, who has a comment on that but I'm to take the takeaway that we're going to look for a larger venue so we can do it in a in one space fair enough yeah as far as I'm concerned okay originally thought about the long gallery um but apparently they're not taking bookings because it's permanently set up at the moment well at the moment it's set up for briefing. media briefings it was uh, an issue was supposed to be discussed um by the commission but i haven't heard what the outcome of that was but we haven't been informed that we can now use it so i still could but we can look for a bigger venue if been. you want that but we could ask because we no, have absolutely. all the facilities here, and it's the cost incurred going out elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you could. It, 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 it makes sense. Okay, so I sort of move on to uh, to item seven uh, on the, uh, the the meeting pack, which is correspondence. Inform members that there's one item of correspondence in the meeting pack. That's item seven point one at page twenty seven. Uh, it's correspondence from the committee for the economy asking whether this committee has received details on the high street task force. Uh, the committee has not received any details and suggests that the information outlined is requested from the TEO and sent to the community com committee uh, for the economy uh, once received. Uh, if we're in agreement, yes. Um, apparently, the executive office uh, will be coming forward with the confirmation as to who's going to be the membership of that. And I would like our committee to have a few that particularly trade unions and retail that the you know it's inclusive mm -hmm. membership mm -hmm. so we would like to see before we get landed with a fait accompli and this is it you know could there be some engagement with the committee beforehand okay well well, well let's let's press on that and, and see what we get back from, and then we can okay. put our, our our stamp onto that we could uh, arrange the, sorry just just to say, is a written briefing uh, I don't okay know. If that, and then if we need an oral yeah, 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 that yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. okay uh, <laughs> item 7.2 at page 37 of the table pack is correspondence from Steve Aiken to the speaker uh, and committee chairs in relation to the internal market bill and other brexit issues uh, the clerk's assistants have confirmed that this letter uh, was not considered by the finance committee and therefore cannot be treated as correspondence from the chair of the committee rather it is from Steve Aiken as the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party um, members would like to consider whether they are content to note the correspondence uh, or whether they wish to take some action. So basically it needs Noted. to go through um, the, the Finance Committee first. Noted. 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 Uh, Chairperson's business, item 8. Uh, if I could just, uh, on, on Chairperson's briefing, at 2 o'clock tomorrow, room 21, uh, there's a meeting with the with members of the, the HIA. Um, if anybody wants to attend that, I will be attending. But if any other member wants to attend, that's two o'clock tomorrow in room twenty twenty one. Chairman's not out of this, but I've placed the board at the time. I probably would have went to that. Yeah. So yeah. you can note me. As I've got I've got justice, but I'm just leaving justice for a while. But but it's it's an open invite if anybody wants to to, to go along. But, but I think I think maybe we could convey to some of the people in case we think we're snubbing them. No, oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I'll do that for anybody. Yeah, and I have health committee myself. So. I, listen, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take I'll take the, that as a, as an apology to anybody who doesn't please, who doesn't please, turn up uh, uh, because there's other. I'm other, Derry, or other I mean, I, and I've already committed. Mm -hmm. A number of meetings. No, absolutely. No, no problem. So. Anybody not there? I'll just give it as yeah. a as a fair, fair call. Um, uh, I have no any. Uh, I have no other business. Uh, does anybody know of any other business? Okay. The time of the next meeting is Wednesday, the seventh of October, uh, two p.m. at uh, room thirty. Uh, and if I can finish off with a plea, please, please, um, mm -hmm. to adhere to social distancing guidelines. This room can only accommodate twelve people. Uh, we will need to assess on a weekly basis whether there is room for witnesses to attend in person or whether they can attend remotely. I therefore encourage all members to let the committee staff know at an early stage whether they will attend each meeting in person or remotely. So what I'm really saying now is please let the staff know if you're going to come here yeah. um, yourselves or not. And I've just finished by uh, thanking all members. Um, I thought it was a good meeting. Uh, I thought there was good scrutiny. Uh, and thank you all for, for your time. Uh, that meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.